Thank you so much. And man, that is exactly what we've been focused on all week. What all he's done. And what we ought to thank him for. And what a joy it is for me. The, from Landmark and, and folks from the community, especially y'all, both are to me. It was Landmark Baptist College that brought me to the Philippines for the first time. Almost three decades ago. And, and began such an Im, important part of my life. Not even just coming here, uh, I, I wasn't doing foreign trips or thinking about foreign trips before uh, they brought me here. It just revolutionized my life and ministry to see what could be accomplished. And so I'm deeply grateful for it. And, and Brother Ton and Brother Mello, uh, their part bringing me here. And the first person I preached for when I come here, the first service they set me up in was to preach for Jimmy Victorino. And uh, that... Jimmy became a very special friend to me, and that church a very, very special part of my life. And uh, I look forward to it every January being there, and it's just been so, so many tremendous blessings. And uh, I have a lot of Edwin Tan stories, and a lot of Mello stories, and a lot of Jimmy Victorino stories collected from over the years. But it is so wonderful to have the opportunity to be here as we look at all this. Well. We're talking about atonement and about the gospel. And um, we'll look at, see, we'll pick up uh, this paragraph reads, The shedding of blood signified a violent death, killing a murder. Life is associated with blood that flows through our veins. Life was given up in the pouring out of its precious blood. Death occurred. The dominant thought of the Old Testament is in, in infliction of death rather than the release of life. Okay? The natural interpretation when we think of blood and the shedding of blood is death. The blood of Christ is a clear expression for the death of Christ. Okay? Blood is the symbol of sacrificial death, a life poured out in death. It's not the releasing of life, but the end of life. Death. Redemption is only possible by blood. Life poured out. It is not just any death. It's the shedding of blood. That's why it's so very important that we keep that truth in front of us. Human body and blood's an interesting thing. When um, a little over four years ago, I was got hit by a semi truck on highway in the United States, my car I was driving. It was a difficult accident. There were people killed in the accident. I was not hurt nearly as bad as, as other people. But uh, the back window of the car shattered and I had little cuts from the glass all over me. So I bled, I mean, I bled all over. I'm just covered with blood. I thought, man, I am in real trouble. And it turned out that was just they were, they were all very tiny surface cuts. And while they were uh, difficult and painful, they weren't any of them life-threatening. Uh, but I saw blood everywhere. Uh, but I had lots of little cuts. But the kind of blood sacrifice we're talking about means something completely different than that. It's draining the blood. Not just bleeding, but draining the blood out of the animal sacrifice just like the blood was drained out of Christ for us. The whole Old Testament sacrifices find their fulfillment in the blood of Christ in his sacrificial death. God achieved our full, complete, comprehensive redemption through the blood of Christ. The substituting sacrifice on the cross is all sufficient and perfect to deal with all our sin and guilt. The Old Testament saints anticipated the death of Christ for their sins by offering animal sacrifices. Jesus Christ is a substitute that has met the holy demands against the sinner. The sinner was forgiven only after the priest offered the blood sacrifice anticipating, I should say, the death of Christ for sin. Our 
our autocorrect was not working very well. It went on this one. The death of Christ for sin. Paul said, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his glory, which he lavished upon us. By offering the sacrificial blood, the worshiper was acknowledging his own guilt and just penalty of death. By the atonement, God was passing over, overlooking, and covering sins until Christ came. So we don't need the sacrifices anymore. Christ has already come. When Christ came and died, he did not pass over or cover it, but he took it away. Behold the lamb that taketh away the sin of the world. Couldn't say that about any of the other lambs. God's infinite holiness was satisfied in the death of Christ. Sacrifice in the Old Testament anticipated the efficacious blood of the perfect lamb of God. The atoning blood of the animal sacrifices by symbolizing the shed blood of Christ served to cover or atone sin till the day when Christ would actually deal with the sin. The death of Christ proved that God was righteous in passing over uh, our sins, the sins for which the animal uh, sacrifices had been shed. And it's coming. God had forgiven sin based on the promise of a sufficient lamb. The death of Christ proved God to be righteous in all that he's promised to the Old Testament saints. Paul had the sacrificial system of the Old Testament in mind when he wrote 1 Peter 1, 18 through 19. So did Paul in Romans 3, 24 through 25, and John in Revelation 5, 6, and 9. Jesus is clearly reminiscent of Isaiah 52 through Isaiah 53, 12, when he speaks of the ransom in Mark 10, 45. There are constant references in the New Testament back to the Old Testament sacrificial system. This set of pictures, the expression, expression blood and cross, blood and cross are synonymous for the substitutionary death of Christ. Now, very, very foolishly, in some of the modern English translations, they take out the word blood and they use the word death. They take out the cross and they use death. And they say, well, see, it means the same thing. Now, first of all, there's a Greek word for blood and a Hebrew word for blood, a Hebrew word for death and a Greek word for death. God gave us the word blood. The blood is the picture of what would literally take place for us. I don't believe the blood of Christ was a picture. The blood of the lamb was a picture. The blood of Christ is what actually paid for our sin. Okay? New translations, when they replace blood and cross with death, are missing some of the truth. Expression, expression blood of Christ is used more frequently in the New Testament than either the death of Christ or the cross of Christ. Christ made an atoning sacrifice by the offering up of his blood. Now, folks who want to change those words say, well, that, that, that's a terrible picture and it turns people off and it causes them not to understand. I would say far to the contrary to you. It's a terrible picture because it was a terrible truth. Our sin had to be paid for. By the blood of Christ. And that if you, you soften that, you miss some of the message to folks. We have been sprinkled with the blood of Christ. But the only remedy for sin is the shed blood of the Lamb of God. The blood of Christ refers to the violent, voluntary, substitutionary death upon cross for men. The blood of Christ reveals the significance which his death bears for sinful men. It is a once-for-all accomplishment. We've been sprinkled by his blood. We have redemption through his blood, propitiation in his blood through faith. We're justified by his blood. We have peace through the blood of the cross. You get it? That's the message over and over again. That is a message so deep and dark and terrible, but that God wants us to get not just a brief mention, this is the theme over and over again. The blood of Jesus removed from the believing sinner the wrath of God. Removed from the believing sinner from the wrath of God. 
God is the one who removes his own wrath by the sacrifice he provides. To propitiate signifies the turning away of anger, usually by an offering. Christ is that offering provided by God. Again, all these words, same truth. Another look at it, another look at it, another look at it, another look at it. It's the most important truth there is. We can't afford to miss it. So we just keep looking at it, looking at it, and looking at it. Over and over again, God gives it to us. Now, we, we move on to the subject of what is the gospel. The gospel actually means, the word gospel means good news. It's everyday, ordinary, two Greek words actually, that mean good news. But let's make sure what we're preaching is really the good news. What if I say, you gotta repent of, I got good news. If you repent of every one of your sins and thus become sinless, you can be saved. Would you walk out of here today thinking that was good news? What if you missed something? What if you didn't understand something? What if you didn't know something was sin? What, what, what if you meant well and the uh, Bible says to honor your father and mother and you just honored them 99% of the time and that meant you were lost? Would that be good news? The Bible tells the husband to love his wife. What if you loved your wife 99% of the time yesterday? And that meant you were lost and died and go to hell. Would that be good news? Or the wife to revere and honor her husband? What if you only honored him 99% of the time yesterday? And some of us can be hard to honor 100% of the time. I mean, would that be good news? What about if, if you're totally 100% sincere, there's a chance for you. Would that be good news? What if you, you just live in victory over sin all the time? That's what you got to do to be saved. Would that be good news? But how about this for good news? My sin has been paid for by Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. 2 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 through 8. The Apostle Paul summarizes the most basic ingredients of the gospel message. Namely, the death, burial, and resurrection and appearances of the resurrected Christ. The gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection does emphasize the appearances as well in that passage. Would you go there with me for a moment? I, we have it out in the, the notes, but you'll get a little bit better, I think, with your Bible right in front of you. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. This is the gospel. The Bible says this is what the gospel is. Okay. And I'm going to read you the gospel. Stop me when I get to the word baptism or repentance or church membership or sincerity or living in victory. Stop me and remind me when we get there. Well, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach unto you, which you have received, also you have received, wherein you stand. By the which you're saved, if you keep in memory that which I preach unto you, lest you believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And he was buried. And he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And he was, after that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of about 500 people, 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me, also as one born out of due time. Why didn't any of you stop me when we got to repentance? Why didn't any of you stop me when we got to church membership? Why didn't any of you stop me when we got to good works? The Bible says this is the gospel. Because those things, again, there is a repentance as part of the gospel, but the repentance that says we're listing all our sins and getting rid of them, none of that is in the gospel. 
That's not the good news. It would be the terrible news, the way so many people preach it. It'd be the heartbreaking news, the impossible news. But this is good news. What's the good news? For I deliver in you first of that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Okay. The gospel is good news. We drop past the scripture. It says, these verses, which were an early Christian confession, give us the heart of the gospel and show how the resurrection is an integral part, integral, integral part of the gospel. Note that Paul described this as of first importance, a phrase that stresses priority, not time. The stress is on the centrality of these truths to the gospel message. Are you ready? I do not care what you get right if you get this wrong. If you get this right, whatever other mistakes you make, there is hope. But if you get this wrong, it doesn't matter what you got right. The central ingredient in the gospel message is a twofold confession. Christ died for our sins. He was raised on the third day. The reality of these two elements can be verified by the scriptures and by such awesome historical evidence as the empty tomb and the eyewitness. The other two elements mentioned here accomplished two important facts. The fact that he was buried verified his death. And the fact that he appeared to others verified his resurrection. Okay. We know he was dead and we know he ro arose. While gospel is often found alone, it is often modified by various terms that focus on a particular aspect of the gospel. In the New Testament, the various modifiers bring out some aspect of the gospel that's being stressed in context, part of the good news, what God offers us in Christ. It is called, for example, number one, the gospel <coughs> of Jesus Christ and the gospel of his son. Okay? That's the good news. Okay? There is no gospel of Buddha. Okay? Buddhism gives you an eightfold path and it says if you do these eight things you can be reincarnated in a better state in the next life where if in that life you do these eight things again you'll be reincarnated in a better state if you do badly you go backwards but you can be reincarnated and someday maybe a thousand lifetimes from now you'll have done the eightfold path well enough times that you might earn your way into some kind of nirvana or heaven is that really good news? There is no good news in Muhammad, which says if you obey five specific principles, which require absolute total devotion to Islam, you, you can be given a reasonably small amount of time in purgatory. Is that good news? Yeah. There is no good news in, in any of the cults. But there's good news in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Christ died for you. That's good news. Okay. Well, the, the, the two descriptions speak of the good news of salvation. It comes through the personal work of Jesus Christ, who is the very son of God in human flesh. Again, this is good news of deliverance from sin's penalty, power, and presence through the two advents of Christ. It's the gospel of peace. Ephesians 6, 15, describes how this good news of salvation in Christ brings peace in all its many aspects. Peace with God, the peace of God, peace with others, world peace, to the victory accomplished by the Savior. It is the gospel of peace. The, uh, it, it's a fascinating thing to me to study. You, you hear little bits of history of the American Indian tribes. Tribes that were displaced as the white settlers came from Europe and spread across the American continent. A very fascinating story about what not, not much has been told. 
has been the preaching of the gospel among the Indian peoples. You, you often hear the story of the warfare. Well, Indians came attacking the incoming settlers. Settlers came and, and seized land and attacked the Indians. And, and lots of movies made about the battles and the warfare and all the things that happened like that. But boy, there's a whole other story. When the gospel was preached, it did not lead to warfare. Over and over again, there are moment, great moments of what God did when the settlers came and they brought first the gospel and preached the gospel to people. Some of the most famous Indian warriors ever were people who eventually found Christ as their savior and it made peaceful people out of them. Geronimo may be the most famous Indian of all time. It may not mean much to your culture or history, but in American history, I mean, he's no, he, was, he was the vicious, successful warrior that killed so many. A lot of folks don't know is um, he got saved. He quit being a warrior after he got saved. In fact, he was being held in prison in St. Augustine, Florida. And, and they, he was such a model prisoner talking about what Christ had done for him. They started letting him out on Sundays. And he would go to a different church every Sunday and give testimony about what it meant uh, to know Christ as Savior. And uh, they trusted him so much, they would let the church come and pick him up, let him leave on his own, the church bring him back. They, they trusted his word that when he left, he would come back. And he dictated his autobiography towards the end of his life. In the last chapter of which he becomes a Christian. And in the course of this, he's dictating it to a person who's writing things down. A person says, why did you become a Christian? And it's very interesting. He says, he became a Christian, not like the Romanists. One Roman Catholic Christian. He became a Christian because he saw Christianity made people better. And he wanted to know how you became better, so he started asking people, how does Christianity make you better? And somebody shared with him what it means to know Christ as your Savior, and Geronimo got saved. Okay. We will share eternity. I, I don't know how all this works in eternity. I have in mind lots of questions I'd like to ask people that are there. I have a lot of questions I'd like to ask Geronimo. I don't know if it works that way or not. But I was, we, we will sing the praises of our Savior in heaven with Geronimo. Quanah Parker was, um, he, he was actually a, his mother was white. She was a captive taken by the Comanche Indians and was impregnated by one of the Comanche captors. And um, Quan is born. His grandfather, his white grandfather, was actually a Baptist preacher. And they had, whose daughter got kidnapped. And they prayed for her when they were not able to rescue her. She was not found until she, many, many years later. And um, when she was found, uh, Quana was not with her. He became maybe the most famous warrior of the American Indian tribes, famous for his campaigns and his abilities and to organize and the warfare and all that. I mean, he was just, um, there, there was a campaign after campaign after campaign to try and defeat Quanah Parker, but he was a brilliant military leader, a brilliant warrior. But eventually... Uh, the Comanche nation is defeated. And when they're defeated, each of the Comanches is given so many acres. And he takes his acreage and sells it and buys a place in town. He moves into town. He starts going to a gospel preaching church in town. It's an unusual situation because the Indians practice polygamy. He had nine wives. He starts going to church with his nine wives. And he and eight of his wives get saved. One, one never does trust Christ, refuses all the time. But he's going to church there with his whole pew full of wives in church. And he got saved. And he's a different man. But he's still a brilliant organizer like he was when he was organizing warfare. 
So he eventually becomes in charge of the church's annual missions conference. And he uses his organizational ability to organize the church's annual missions conference. And the same guy that had been famous on the battlefield is now famous for putting on the most elaborate mission conferences. So what happened? Lord saved him. At some point the message got to to him. And I have no doubt that when his Baptist preacher grandfather was praying, oh Lord, look after our little girl that was taken, that his grandson finding Christ one day was part of the answer to those prayers. Okay. It's good news. I don't care who you are. If you're Geronimo, it's good news. If you're Quanah Parker, it's good news. I don't care who you are, it's good news. Okay. There's been more than one story uh, of vicious serial killers in the United States, horrible people who murdered many people um, in prison, who found Christ as their savior, lived out a lifetime in prison with a testimony for the Lord, or went to the death penalty, but with a testimony for Christ and what Christ had done for them. Because guess who this is for? Guess who this is good news for? It's good news for serial killers. I was in uh, Cambodia. Uh, I originally went there to preach for some of the Filipino pastors there, but was also involved with some of the American missionaries. And um, many of you may know of what they refer to as the Cambodian Holocaust. The communists took control of Cambodia in the 70s, and it was horrible, and they, they, they killed a third of the people, trying to create a pure population that could handle communism. Horrible time. Many, much memory of it over there yet. You can go to the killing fields where people were buried. There's a museum devoted to the Holocaust, Cambodian Holocaust. Pictures of what happened. They, they, they photographed everything. And 36 rooms they say nobody's ever got through the whole thing because it's so horrible. I went through 13 rooms and said, please, get me out of here. I don't want to see any more of this. It's with a Filipino pastor who took me through. And uh, while, I'm in the, uh, while I'm there, one of the American missionaries is telling me, you know, when this, when that, that finally overthrew the communist, the move, the communist army moved out into a jungle area that was claimed by the Muslims. And they allowed them to go there to create their own city. They didn't arrest them, but they had to live in that city. They can't just go anywhere they want. So they, they had this communist city in the Muslim section. And uh, that's where they've been lived. That's where they, the army has lived. Still looks like a military thing, compound. But Recently, an American missionary had gone there and started a church. And they wanted to know if I would go preach there. And they said, we'll have an evangelistic meeting at 10 o'clock on Thursday morning. So I'm thinking American. Nobody's coming to a 10 o'clock in the morning meeting in the United States on Thursday. But they said, we'll have a 10 o'clock meeting. We go out there. And the guy that's taking me out, his father had been a doctor to Paul Pot, the communist dictator. And he knew some of these people. And there's about 50 of Paul Pot's soldiers who come at 10 o'clock in the morning to this meeting. And, and I'm, I'm going to be talking to 50 of the worst mass murderers that ever existed. And then the most amazing thing happened. It could not happen in the United States. The local elementary school canceled school and sent 200 kids over for the evangelistic meeting. I got 200 Cambodian kids and 50 Pol Pot soldiers. And the guy's telling me, the translator's telling me, he knows some of these people, who they are and what position they held and all that. What do you say to 50 of the worst mass murderers that ever lived and 200 kids at the same time. 
You know what the answer to that is? There is good news. Because it doesn't matter who you are or what your background is or what your story is or what your situation is when Jesus Christ died on the cross. He died for you. We had an invitation. Over a hundred kids came to trust Christ as their Savior. And over 25 of Paul Pot's soldiers came to trust Christ as their soldiers. Would the Lord save a mass murderer like that? Who did Jesus Christ die on the cross for? For the sins of the whole world. That's what I preached on that morning. For the sins of the whole world. Because and, and I even said it and put it. said the sins of the whole world means your sins. Because it does. It's good news. Man, that's good news. Well, it's called the gospel of peace. It's called the eternal or everlasting gospel. Romans 14, 6 expands our perspective of the gospel as we normally think of it. The gospel is proclaimed by the angel, has several key elements of gloriously good news that are developed in three commands and two reasons. Command number one, fear God. This refers to a holy reverence that recognizes the sovereign authority and power of God to deal with man in his holy wrath and thus to bring to an end to the world of sin as we know it. To fear God is to recognize him as the true God who can destroy the soul and not just the body as God will do with the beast of revelation, his anti-God system. Command two, and command one is fear God. Command two, give him glory. This refers to the praise and honor that should accrue to God for mankind due to our recognition and high estimation of God as the sovereign creator of the universe. Command three, and worship him who made the creator. The word worship means to show reverence or respect. This word emphasizes the external display as seen in our obedience, prayer, singing, form of worship. The word fear emphasizes a reverential mental attitude behind the worship. In the tribulation period, in the tribulation, people will be forced to fear and formally acknowledge the beast and his image. In this message, the angel is demanding that mankind reject the beast and formally turn to God to worship him. Reason number one, the hour of his judgment has come, is a reference to the final judgment of the tribulation, the bold judgments, which are about to occur, that will put an end to the system, the beast, and bring the rule of the Lord Jesus Christ, King of Kings. Reason number two, this is seen in the reference to God as the creator uh, in verse seven. Here we are called to pay attention to the ageless and universal message of the creation itself. Finishing this up, C.H. McIntosh on the glory of the gospel. I mentioned McIntosh earlier. He used to be a very popular writer. You don't see his books much anymore. He wrote a series of commentaries on Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy that are just magnificent in constantly showing you the gospel in the sacrifices and the feasts. There it is. I mentioned part of this quote previously, but I mentioned it a little bit longer form here. Yes, he himself has done it. This is the very gist and message, the heart's core of the whole manner. God has laid our sins on Jesus. And he tells us so in his holy word, so that we may know it upon divine authority, an authority that cannot lie. For God planned it, God did it, God says it's all of God. From first to last, we have simply to rest in it like a little child. How do I know that Jesus bore my sins in his own body on the tree? By the very same authority which tells me I had sins to be born. God in his marvelous and matchless grace assures me a poor, guilty, hell-deserving sinner, that he has himself undertaken the whole matter of my sins and disposed of it in such a manner as to bring a rich harvest of glory. As to bring a rich harvest of glory to his own eternal name 
throughout the wide universe in presence of all created intelligence. This is what Macintosh got from the offerings in the first five books of the Bible. Jesus laid it all upon himself. That's what all those offerings were pictures of. Glory. Okay. Let's go uh, into the next study. Salvation and eternal security. We begin with a statement from Watchman Nee, who's a Chinese preacher, and, and I particularly included that. I'll be teaching this at Dayspring, our college in the United States, where uh, this last year we got five students from mainland China who are the product of the ministry of Watchman Nee. We have more students, I understand, arriving there this week from mainland China, from churches that were started by this particular preacher, Watchman Nee. So I went out of my way to find a statement for him to throw in there for them. Watchman Nee. Once a man is born of God, he can never be treated by God as not having been born of him. However endless eternity may be, this relationship and this position cannot be annulled. This is because what a believer receives at new birth is not contingent upon a progressive spiritual and holy pursuit after he believes, but is the pure gift of God. It is the pure gift of God. What if I'm not faithful? He will be. It's not about my being faithful. It's about his being faithful. What God bestows is eternal life. How long does eternal last? So I had eternal life till I lost it. You know, how long does eternal life last? Eternity? By definition? Somebody, I, I get five to seven questions from people about the Bible a day. Some are worth spending time on, some are just ridiculous, but somebody Facebooked me a question the other day. He says, how do we know eternal life lasts forever? My answer was, because it is eternal. Okay. No possibility exists for this life and position to be abrogated. Following notes are from Harry Carr. Introduction. Is a person once saved, always saved? Is it possible to lose our salvation and then regain it at some future time? How many times can a person be born again? There are two schools of thought on the subject. The words eternal security or security of the believer do not appear in the scriptures. However, the doctrine represented by these statements is a valid biblical doctrine. People say, oh, that term is not in the Bible, so it's a new idea. Somebody just came up with it. No, the Bible discusses eternal life, okay? the gift of eternal life. Eternal security is not the newcomer. In fact, it is the established doctrine. The newcomer is Arminianism. That is a belief you can lose your salvation. Probably 50% of the people who claim to be evangelicals in the world, that number comes from the various groups that are identified in their attendance and so forth. Probably 50% of the people who claim to be evangelicals in the world believe that you can lose your salvation. That is tragic. Personally, I have friends that disagree with me. I believe some of them are saved, but confused. But what are they missing when they don't realize the fullness of what we have in Christ? History of Arminianism. The doctrine that one could lose his or her salvation was first taught by Jacob Herman, or Arminius. That's a Latin version of his name. From him comes the term Arminianism. Jacob Arminius was born in the Netherlands and pastor in Amsterdam. He was appointed as a professor of theology at the University of Leiden. His lectures would influence many young men trained for the ministry. Although Jacob was taught Calvinistic doctrine, he began to deny the strong doctrine of predestination as taught by Calvin and made election dependent on the action of men. He rightly taught that Christ died for all men, 
but also taught it was possible to fall from grace. That as he taught it, believers could lose their salvation. Excuse me. The strict Calvinist had removed the will of man from salvation while Armenians included it. His followers called Armenians or Remonstrants set forth the teaching to a document called Remonstrants containing five articles. They're answering the Calvinists. So God elects or approves on the basis of foreseen faith or unbelief. Christ died for all men and for every man. The only believers are saved. Man is so depraved that divine grace is necessary into faith or any good deed that grace may be resisted. Whether all who are truly regenerate will certainly persevere in the faith is a point that will need further investigation. Words, he, he, he was right on the first four things. He said, we just don't know for sure if you're going to be permanently saved. Is it possible to turn your back on your salvation? Okay. Well, we need to address that as we're discussing salvation. If 50% of the people that claim to be saved believe that you can lose your salvation, we then have a very serious problem. So take a break, and we will try to address that problem when you come back.